Uh, next one is uh, Atul, and he's going to talk about service meshes. So take it away. Yep. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. For, <laughs> thank you so much for that, and thanks for being here, uh, especially after a long day. Uh, I'm going to be talking about service mesh and chaos engineering. Uh, and to put a disclaimer, I'm relatively new to both these technologies. Uh, I've been in this uh, cloud native space for just about a couple of years now. So the entire cloud native Kubernetes is, is something new, and I keep on uh, learning. Uh, I'm Atul, and I'm from Hyderabad, India. Any one of you are aware of Hyderabad? Uh, Indian food, how many of you like Indian food? Okay, a lot of people. So, so Hyderabad is home to biryani. If you, if you have heard biryani, then Hyderabad is home for one of the best biryanis in, uh, uh, in India, I can say. Uh, outside of that, I work as a senior developer advocate at InfraCloud. And uh, as part of that, I help developers and other clients adopt open source technologies and projects. And I do, the, do that by means of you know, creating developer documentations, webinars, and giving talks like these. Uh, I'm also a CNCF ambassador, uh, an open source contributor, and maintainer for a project called Parallels, which is a zero trust based access management tool that we just sandboxed last year. Uh, outside of work, I am a food and travel blogger. I've been blogging for a decade, uh, maybe 14 years now. On socialmaraj.com, I write about food and travel. You can connect with me on Twitter, slash X, at the rate the tech Maharaj and Atul Maharaj. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, agenda uh, is fairly simple. I'll be talking a bit about service mesh. Uh, and that really depends on how well aware are you of service mesh, any service mesh. OK, so I think concepts are there, so we can probably uh, you know, get that part done faster. And then I'll touch a bit about reliability, uh, you know, why, why reliability is required and uh, how, how you need to focus on it. Uh, and then we'll talk about why reliability in service mesh, because service mesh has a lot of moving parts, a lot of components and modules present. So what are the challenges when you want to implement reliability in a service mesh? And then I'll introduce the concept of chaos engineering. And then we'll look into an open source tool called Litmus uh, Chaos. So service mesh, this is a, a very simple uh, diagram of what a service mesh is, what it does, how it works. So usually it, it works with microservices, and then you have a proxy. It becomes your data plane, you have a control plane, and then everything goes through that. And that's basically, essentially, what a service mesh does. There are a lot of different projects available. Istio is one of the most popular ones, which I would be using for this demo as well. Uh, when it comes to benefits, it's pretty straightforward. You know, It helps us uh, discuss service discovery. So if without a service mesh, it becomes really difficult to identify what are the services, microservices that your application is using. Uh, you know, which service is used where, how the communication is happening between the services. So it helps with that. It does traffic routing as well. So let's say if you are doing a deployment strategy, let's say a blue-green strategy or a canary release. So Service Mesh can help you shift your traffic from one version to the other version as well. It helps you with load balancing. Uh, you have a concept called weights. So you can define that the traffic which is coming into your application, you send 10% here, 90% there, so on and so forth. Uh, it also provides you with observability. Uh, you know, it's it's not inbuilt, but then that is that is an advantage that that it gives. Uh, it it is also a, it is a secured way of communication because most of the transportation or uh, communication that happens with service meshes is, uh, you know, you can apply TLS certificates, so you know that anything that is moving through your service mesh is uh, you know encrypted, and then. The biggest part here is its platform independence. So it's not that you can work use it only with Kubernetes. Irrespective of what platform you are using, you can use a service mesh. Now, uh, when I said you know uh, service mesh as a tool is pretty complex because there are a lot of parts involved with it. Now, when I mentioned that, uh, I'm sure a lot of you would have heard about sidecar less service mesh, which is a trend which is happening now. You know, you would have heard about ambient service mesh and the sidecar really going away. But then this year really focuses on if the uh, you have the sidecar still present. So there are a lot of configurations that you need to take care of while you are implementing a service mesh. And that can really mean about how you are setting up your pods, how the traffic is moving, where it is going, the kind of security that you need to have in place. So there are a lot of uh, settings that you need to do when you are, uh, you know, uh, implementing a service mesh. Uh, similarly, when it comes to uh, service discovery and routing as well. Now, even though you can define that 10% you know, of the traffic goes to service A, the 90% goes to service B, but then the reliability is again a challenge because you don't know really when 
that whether you giving the weight of 10% and 90%, whether that will actually happen in every scenario or not. So that's one. Uh, similarly, latency and performance. So what happens is that when you are implementing a service mesh, uh, which is you know essentially a, a, a network layer uh, tool, which helps you move uh, you know move your data in packets. Uh, what happens is that many times when you are implementing such things, you rarely think about the situations like when the network goes down or when there is absolutely the, the ping is low or the or the bandwidth is low. How will your service mesh behave in that case? So latency and performance testing for your service mesh also becomes critical. Uh, and similarly, what if a node goes down or what if uh, you know the network completely disconnects? So those kind of situations, whether your service mesh is able to handle that fault or whether you have designed it or implemented it in a way that it can handle such kind of faults which are uh, injected. Uh, and also security and authentication. So most of the service mesh has support for, let's say, OIDC or, you know, uh, sorry, not OIDC, but you, you can put in certificates, you know, TLS certificates. You can ensure that every request that comes in is authenticated, is authorized, and then the flows goes on. So taking care of all these things when it comes to reliability within a service mesh, which is already complex, it becomes really difficult to tackle that. And so while I spoke about why it is important in service mesh, I think we need to also touch upon reliability imperative. I think this slide had to come earlier, uh, but but I'm discussing <laughs> discussing this now. So uh, basically, you know, we, we all are talking about DevOps, and uh, you know, this practice has been there for a long time uh, that you know you need to uh, ship features faster, and DevOps is that one thing that helps you to move things faster to your customers. And uh, one of the biggest driving principles for the adoption of DevOps is speed. Because you tell people that you know you need to have competitive edge, you need to have an advantage over your competitor, you need to ship features faster, implement DevOps, get on Kubernetes, ship your features faster. So uh, while, this, while the speed is already there, what happens essentially is that your focus on quality reduces. Because now your focus is on shipping things faster. And because of that, there might be chances of having a bug or a failure at a later stage in the product life cycle. So you need to focus on quality as well when you are focusing on speed. And same things, you know, when, when you talk about qualities is another challenge because now when you are building applications, features, containers, what is happening is your release cycle is becoming shorter because you are able to ship things faster. What it essentially is also doing is that it is reducing the time that you get for testing as well. So previously, if your testing team got a week to, you know, test your product, now apparently they're getting only two days to test the same thing again. So while you are trying to increase the speed of shipping features, what is actually it is doing is it is affecting the quality as well. So you need to keep a track or find a balance between the speed and the quality. And lastly, what happens is, uh, you know, obviously uh, developer productivity is affected because now what is happening is your developers who are required to work on new features are actually focusing on fixing bugs that is arising because of the quality. So you want them to fit, uh, you know, push features faster with high quality and without any bugs coming in place. Now, this is something only a magician can do because you cannot handle all three of them, especially as a same person or a developer handling all three. And that is where I think the focus should shift to CR as well. So you have continuous integration that all of us are doing. We have continuous deployment that all of us are doing. What we also need to add is a continuous reliability as well. And why do I say that? So if you see essentially or traditionally, the testing practices are focused more on a particular feature. So let's say I have a login feature. The test case which I'll write will check whether the, feature, the, the login screen works properly or not. But what you need to actually see here is that irrespective of what happens, whether my product is working fine or not is something what continuous reliability or reliability is all about. So essentially, I don't test my application for a particular feature. I take, I test it on an overall basis. So irrespective of what happens, my product should work. Whether I'm writing a test case for a you know, login screen or an authentication or whatever, the focus here is on the larger uh, perspective of the product, whether it is working as expected, irrespective of what happens. I don't I don't mind what's going on, whether this container is working, the password is not working, but the application should work. And that is where I think CR is something that practice has to be there involved, integrated within your CI CD, 
uh, pipelines as well, so that when you are building applications, when you are deploying them, your focus should be there on the reliability as well. So when you talk about reliability at very high level, it is about reliability of services that you give to your end customer. So it could be downtime, it could be latency, things like that. Then you need to also focus on reliability against faults that may occur. So like I told you, know, what if a node goes down? So these are the things which the customer doesn't care because for them, it's more important that the latency should be, he should not be seeing a loading screen when he taps the button. So for them, reliability is that. But the moment you get down a little bit to, let's say your engineering team, this is what matters to them that, okay, if a pod goes down, how will my service or the application respond? And then what we need to do and how we can achieve this is by defining a steady state. And that's what we'll talk about coming to uh, uh, chaos engineering. So these are the benefits where when you have, when you implement reliability, you know, you will have your enhanced user experience because we spoke about when you have reliability uh, imbibed in your entire chain, eventually what will happen is it will give your customers a better experience. Uh, it also helps you define business continuity because you will be putting in a lot of checks that we uh, will discuss now that will help you ensure that your application is up and running, providing the right experience. Uh, it helps you deal with security and compliances as well because those are again some tests and cons uh, some tests and scenarios that we'll apply. Uh, it definitely gives you an operational efficiency because here your developers are again not focusing on fixing bugs now because your reliability itself is integrated when you are developing. So chances of having failures at the end reduces uh, drastically and obviously the competitive advantage that, that we sell to the C-suit people that you do this and you will have a competitive edge over your uh, customers. So introducing chaos engineering, uh, how many of you over here have gone into a, gone on a roller coaster? I mean, have, have, you, have you sat on a roller coaster? I think everyone. Okay, I have not because that's, that's not the adventure I like. Uh, so I've never been on a roller coaster. But what you see, what usually happens on a roller coaster, so you sit down, you have all your uh, you know, harnesses uh, buckled up, and then the roller coaster just starts moving. So it'll start slow, and then suddenly at a point it'll come and then it'll just go down and zoop, zap, zoop, zap. You're going in all the directions and then you come back uh, you know, after the entire ride. So I use that example to explain chaos engineering for your application or software. So you have a software in place, you have your application, uh, you know what all features it has or what all functionality it has. What you do is you insert controlled faults within your application to see how your application responds. So which is similar to you sitting in a roller coaster, right? You going here and there and a lot of things happening. We give your application a roller coaster ride through chaos engineering. Now, there is a misconception that chaos engineering means breaking your system, but then uh, essentially chaos engineering is all about introducing controlled faults within your system and then seeing how your system actually responds to those faults. And based on the faults, uh, based on how your system actually responds, you devise mechanisms and you know uh, fix your fix your processes to ensure that those things don't uh, happen. So chaos engineering as a concept was started by uh, folks at Netflix because uh, you know they are the pioneers in microservices, and that's where they wanted something to manage the reliability of of your of their applications. So uh, in terms of principles, there are four basic steps uh, which comes into chaos engineering. Uh, the first one is about hypothesizing, hypothesizing your system behavior under failed scenarios, which means, let's say I'm using a service mesh here, which has a sidecar. What if the sidecar goes down for, for whatever reason? Maybe it's out of memory error and uh, that, that, that container got killed. Uh, what will happen when that goes down? So that is first, that, 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 that is what you need to define, uh, that how your system will behave in case of a failure scenario. And then you define a steady state. When everything is working fine, how does your application respond? And then what you do is you simulate the real world condition, which is basically you purposely kill that container and then see how your system actually responds to that. And then you check how, how much or what the deviation is between your steady state when everything works fine. And then when your pod goes down, what is the difference in that? And that's where you understand that, okay, this is, when I do this, this happens and that is what I need to Fix. I'll talk about that. I mean, I'll show a demo. So that will give you a better idea of what I'm, uh, you know, trying to say. So you start by a hypothesis, you define a steady state, and then you do a real world uh, scenario, and then you test it in your uh, production setup. Now, chaos is all about designing chaos experiments. So while chaos engineering is a, a very huge term, uh, what we do essentially is we create different experiments. And I would like to present those experiments as knowns and unknowns. So essentially, 
when any organization is starting this is this is a very good reference to start your chaos engineering journey so which basically is if you see uh, if you go through known and known so it is basically things you are aware of and you understand so for example let's say if if i increase the 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 latency of the application if if i increase the latency in the network the application will show me a loading uh, you know screen for a longer time so i know that when i'm introducing this this is the outcome that i'm going to get uh, similarly if we go and and the next one is unknown and unknown these are the scenarios when you don't know what will happen and you don't know how your system will respond for example entire east us aws going down now this is something you never imagine you never plan for but what if it goes down how does your system respond in that case you have absolutely no idea so that becomes the unknown and unknown and then let us touch about known and unknown so this basically is let's say you know that when a pod is deleted you know it will come back online but how much time will it take to come online that is something that you are not aware of so that comes under the known and unknown bucket and then you have an unknown so unknown is basically where you don't know how much time a cluster will come to uh, you know how much time a cluster will take to come back online but you know that if the cluster doesn't come back you have a dr in place which will shift the traffic to other cluster so here you don't know what will happen but you know the outcome that can happen so generally when you design chaos experiments it should be in these buckets and essentially when you are starting out it's always bet best to start with known and known so you know that when you inject when you kill a pod latency will happen or the application will not be accessible so you start your journey by creating experiment which are known known and then slowly and steadily you move to unknowns uh now chaos engineering tools in cncf now there are a lot of tools that helps you create chaos scenarios uh these this is what i have taken from the cncf landscape and the popular ones which you see are chaos mesh and litmus chaos both of them are cncf uh, incubating projects and uh, these projects help you create a lot of scenarios and put your applications under uh, stress for uh, for checking the reliability now i'll quickly go through this i think this is uh, you know probably not required to be gone into depth so these are the litmus chaos concept so you have an engine which is the core of uh, litmus where everything happens and then you have chaos experiments these are the experiments you design based on the known unknown what will happen uh, uh, and what the outcome is and then you have the operator which is there for the kubernetes which basically uh, you know manages the executions and then you have a result and then you have probes and actions so this is basically for adding recovery capabilities again an architecture of uh, litmus chaos how how it works in the various uh components and uh, i'll quickly get into the demo and i am not i'm not doing a live demo i have a video i'll just play that video because i didn't want anything to go wrong with the demo so what i'm doing here is i'm using minikube istio litmus and kiali uh what i have done is a very simple uh, example of uh, yeah so what i'm doing here is i'm i have installed istio on a cluster and if you if you have worked with istio it provides you with a demo application as a demo profile so this application is basically a book information so there are multiple microservices in this and each microservice is responsible for a particular task so there are microservices which which talk about the rating which talk about the review and uh, so this is a very basic cluster with istio installed with the particular uh, book info application that i was talking about so so on my cluster i have that this is the application so there are microservices which are responsible for rating for the reviews uh, you know get set update delete uh, what i'm doing next is that i am installing kiali which is basically a dashboard again that comes bundled with istio itself in the demo profile so kiali is nothing but it's an observability tool similar to grafana but it creates a, a i mean because it has a very good integration with uh, istio by default i have used that here so when kiali is installed what it what it does is that it'll give you a view of your services within so this is what kiali gives you for your service mesh so i have the book info application i have service mesh i have istio installed on top of it so it gives me a list of all the services that are present what are the namespace what are the labels what are the attributions and the moment if you want to see you know uh, how the traffic flows what i'll do is uh, so before that i'll also ready my system with installing uh, litmus chaos again i'm using helm chart so helm install litmus 
uh, we are installing that. And then what it does is after that, it gives me access to the Litmus dashboard. So you can use Litmus through CLI. You can use it through dashboard. To keep things easy, I have kept the dashboard uh, over here. And what we are essentially doing, going to do over here is, uh, yeah, so we'll start by creating a chaos scenario. So the moment you install uh, Litmus on your cluster, it creates an operator or an agent on your uh, cluster. And this is the self agent which you see. So this is actually running on my cluster. So the moment I give any chaos experiments, that will be executed uh, on my uh, cluster. So if you see, these, these are the uh, chaos uh, related uh, resources that are created. Now, the next step is creating an experiment. So this is where I'm choosing how to create an experiment. So there are different ways. I can create a new scenario by a predefined template. I can clone an existing chaos scenario which somebody has already created. I can create an experiment from Chaos Hub. So Chaos Hub is a repository where people can submit uh, chaos experiments that they have created. And so to keep things easy, I'll be using uh, the ones from the Chaos Hub. So you give the name of a scenario. And then you decide the flow of the experiment that you want. So let's say what I'm doing here is basically just killing the Istio container. Uh, but apart from that, if you want to do anything extra, you can do that. So these are the experiments which uh, Chaos provides by default. So if you see here, you have Azure Disk Loss, you have Cassandra Pod Delete, you have GCP VM Instance Stop. So these are the scenarios which are predefined by Chaos. So if you want to, let's say, insert a fault when an Azure disk is gone, if your application is using an Azure-based disk, you can use this experiment, give it the credentials for your Azure disk, and what this will do is this will replicate the scenario where the Azure disk goes down. So these are predefined templates which are present and there are a lot of them. And these are, so they have generic container kill. So which you can apply to any uh, container, Kubernetes cluster, and you can uh, delete that. Then you have, uh, you know, memory hog, CPU hog. So this is, these are predefined. You just select that and it will be able to run. So what I'm using is I'm actually using a container kill because that is what we'll be killing. And then you define the target application. So in this case, it is the book info application, which, which is here. And then I need to define a selector. So because I'm killing the Istio container, I need to define the selector to identify the Istio container. Uh, once that is done, I'll start my experiment. And uh, right, so this is, where, this is where you define weights. So weights are basically for your organization if you want to uh, give priority to a particular experiment. So 10 means, uh, you know, very, uh, uh, very important. And then one is like very less important. And then you can schedule it or you can run it immediately. I'll run it immediately. And what I'm doing next is this is a graph which it shows when I actually start a experiment. So it is creating the resources. Uh, this is what I'm doing just to generate a load. So when I run this, it will uh, simultaneously send about 100, 200 requests to my application. And the moment I do that, if you go to Kiali, it will give me a graph of how my traffic is flowing. So it comes to Ingress, and then this is how the request is flowing to the different services, which is there in the book info application. Now you see the experiment is running. What I have done is, so in, experiment is installed. Now it is doing a container kill. It is going to kill a container in the product page, which is your Istio container. So I'm just refreshing the page here just to see whether the container has killed or not, because the experiment is already running in background. So if you see here, I think after a couple of retries, it will give an error, no healthy upstreams available. So this error is coming because your chaos experiment is running, which has basically killed your container. And the moment you go to Kiali, you will see this red and yellow line coming in. You will see a lot of, uh, you will see a rise in 500 errors because your container is down. So what essentially I try to show over here is that this is one scenario of you killing a container. And you saw in Chaos Hub that there are li limitless opportunities and you know templates available, which can create different faults. So in an ideal situation, what you could do is you could kill a container, you could probably uh, have a memory hog. You, so you could basically add three, four different Chaos experiments, run it on the same thing, and then see how your experiment, uh, how your application actually behaves. And in that case, once you know how your application is behaving, you can then take measures to fix those uh, while you're developing itself. So that's the benefit of uh, you know, doing uh, chaos engineering. You are entering, you are uh, you know, putting in your uh, control faults at different uh, places in the application, and then seeing how your application uh, responds. So 
coming back to you know what what i started uh, what i started with that when you talk about reliability your focus should be that irrespective of what happens whether the test fails or whether there is an environment change for me it's important that my uh, you know application always works and these are just the what next steps so now that you know the application has uh, you know the experiment has passed the uh, uh, the the result is out you know you get the data assess what the impact is see why that particular uh, issue happened document it remediate and repeat and reiterate so yeah with that i think uh, i am at the end uh, thank you so much to everyone sitting here we have two minutes for questions i'm sorry <laughs> anyone no okay thank you Atul, again thank you so much for having me here great experience